But uh, I, I want to show you how things have changed uh, in our country. When I was in school, the principal of my school led our choir. I mean the principal of my school led our choir in that song, The Lord is My Shepherd. This was a public school I went to. And the principal himself taught that song to the choir. And we sang that song, The Lord is My Shepherd. It was the climax song of the program that night. Just to show you how things have changed. Boy, now you can't even mention Jesus' name hardly at all without getting attacked. I found out a lot of times people are okay as long as they say God. But you bring it down to where the rubber meets the road. And that's, that wasn't the right thing to say. You, you bring it down to where the blood is shed. You bring it down to Calvary. You mention in Jesus' name, and another matter comes up altogether. Well, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, and I want to go back uh, to my Wednesday evening lessons now about the things dealing with some of our higher ground passages that we have had. And uh, in 1 Thessalonians, we had, you recall, please, chapter number 5, verses 14 through 23. And these verses happen to contain a series of character traits that are for Christians especially. And oh, how we need to implement these in our lives. I'd like to begin my reading in verse number 14, and I will go through verse 23 and then go back. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly or that are out of rank, out of step with the things that are of Jesus Christ. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven, I pray thee to illumine our hearts and our minds as we look into thy word. I pray, O God, thee to feed us, that we might be strengthened in thy way that we might grow in grace and knowledge of thee, Lord Jesus. In thy name I ask it. Amen. Now, in these verses, I've already had a couple of lessons, so I want to kind of pick up where I left off. But I would like to do just a little bit of review, if I may. In order for a person, a child of God to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord, I think they have to have a teachable spirit, what I call a teachable spirit. Unfortunately, uh, too many times we get our backs up and get all bent out of shape when somebody tries to bring about a kind of reproof or rebuke in our lives. And nobody likes reproof, nobody likes to be rebuked, but uh, According to the book of Proverbs, that is the way of life, if you're reading through the book of Proverbs once a month. And to show the importance of this, I'd like for you to turn with me while holding your finger in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 there, to Proverbs and chapter number 5. Now, one of the themes running through the book of Proverbs is cautioning uh, young men on the dangers of not maintaining purity a 
as regards relationships. The Bible teaches that those relationships are right and good within the confines of the biblical standard, but that they're wrong and harmful outside those confines of biblical standards, which of course uh, we come down to marriage and a lot of other things. In this fifth chapter, the Bible plainly brings that to our attention. If you begin your reading in verse number 3, which I won't, but you can when you get the chance to see what I mean. And then you'll see how that this becomes a real problem. Uh, kind of the crux of the matter, though, comes down at the end of that paragraph, uh, where in the admonition from the... Proverbs writer, of course it's God, but uh, generally we would think of Solomon in this case because of chapter number one. Uh, we come to this teaching part, uh, the what some might call moral of the business or whatever, is uh, coming in verse number eight and following. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Now look at verse number 12 carefully in regards to what I said a moment ago about having a teachable spirit. And say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. And so, as I look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, we have several things here, boom, 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 that I think would lead one to believe that these characteristics are greatly needed in the Christian life. We are to incorporate them in there. But if we're going to gain from this, if we're going to get out of it what we need to get out of it, we're going to have to have that teachable spirit. A lot of times we don't want to listen uh, to what the preacher has to say. A lot of times, uh, as long as it's all flowery and nice and positive and make you feel good style messages, well, that's fine. But when it goes to stepping on the toes to where it's really going to do some good, we don't want to get that whatsoever. But that's exactly what we need if we're honest with ourselves. And that's exactly what preachers need to get involved in in this day. Uh, I am personally of the thought that many preachers, even in independent fundamental style churches, are caving in to the modus operandi of the day rather than standing firm and trying to teach the way of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to say this, when a preacher does that, he does not mean to hurt you. He's trying to help. When a preacher preaches against sin and names it and spells it out, he's not trying to run you down. Uh, hopefully, if he is, he's got problems himself and needs to... Uh, uh, go to the Lord and, and get right, in, in my opinion. But I, but I would try to encourage you to understand that, that as a shepherd wants to help his sheep and watch over his sheep as, well, per David, back in the Old Testament, when the lion and the bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, David said, I delivered him out of his mouth. I... I uh, took the lamb back. And in so many words, you read that from David there in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel when he was talking to King Saul. It's like David told the lion and the bear, now you run on. Uh, you leave my sheep alone. And uh, David said the lion and the bear didn't want to listen to reason. Now this is Burke Holder Reeves talking now. But uh, David said they, they wouldn't do like I asked them to do. They turned on me. And so David said, I, in so many words, I killed them. I took them out. 
And that's what was going on there. And uh, brothers and sisters, you, you've got to understand and realize that a, a pastor, according to the New Testament, especially if you think of Hebrews chapter number 13, is trying... Well, he is portrayed in that role as the under-shepherd, as they that watch for your souls. So hopefully you won't allow the devil to talk you into taking it wrongly, but to have instead a teachable spirit. Now in this particular business, of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, there's another thing that is interesting for us to consider, and this again is by way of review, but it is, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. Now that's just the opposite of what most of us would tend to do. We tend to want to get even. Isn't that the nature of mankind? Well, he hit me first. Ah, yabba dabba do, so on and so forth. But the Bible says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. There's a couple of verses of Scripture that are interesting to look at in this regards, and I referred to them, but I did not read them last week. And I'd like for you to turn with me while, well, again, keeping your finger or ribbon in your Bible in First Thessalonians chapter number 5. Look at Matthew chapter number 7. In Matthew chapter number 7, I want to begin my, begin my reading, please, way back in verse number 7, even though the verse that I'm most interested in is verse number 12. Verse number 7 of chapter 7 in the Gospel of Matthew says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, among other things that you can get out of that, you can get this. It's our responsibility to not only make ourselves available to the teachings of God, but to seek them. Right? Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. A lot of us want God to do everything for us. And I sometimes think he has to do everything for us, to tell you the truth, the givens the likes we are. But still, God lays the doorstep of responsibility at our house. I think that God wants us to be responsible people, and it is right that a child of God seek a discerning spirit. It is right that a child of God seek instruction from the Word of God and from hopefully those who have a degree of maturity in the Word, which the pastor ought to be one of those, or else you need to get a new pastor. Uh, here I'm going to read further. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. Don't you see personal responsibility in there? I do. Boy, a lot of people fail to realize that, listen, it just doesn't come automatically. You've got to discipline yourself and get in it. And then, to him that knocketh, it shall be open. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts, give good things to them that ask him? Now verse 12, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now one more verse if you look at Luke chapter number 6 real quick like. And then I want to make uh, just a real brief commentary on this. In Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 31, here's what the Bible says. Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole, uh, pardon me, I'm in the wrong chapter. Chapter 6 and verse number 31, not 5. That, that's a good verse in chapter number 5, but it's number 6 that I want to look at today. Here Jesus says, And as ye would that men should do to you, 
do ye also to them likewise. Now, I want to call to your attention, if I may please, that this is active, not reactive. Or should I say this is proactive, not reactive. In other words, uh, don't wait until they have done something bad to you and then you're going to do something good for them. Uh, the idea is do it up front whether they do something good for you or not. As you would have men do to you, so do to them. No matter what they're like, you do right, and I'm going to add something now that's very important. You do right in the eyes of God regardless of what the next person is doing. Whether they are doing it or not, let us have the spirit of our doing what we ought to be doing before God Almighty. So it's not only a teachable spirit, but is that spirit of oh, uh, whether the next guy lives for God or not, I'm going to live for God. Whether the next guy is doing what the Bible says or not, I'm going to try to do. I need to add that try to do because none of us are perfect and we're not going to do it perfectly. But we ought to have that attitude. You see, a person's attitude makes all the difference in the world. As I've said before in some of my messages, I know a little bit about sports, and it was Guy Lombardi who said the best uh, uh, ability that a person can display is uh, availability, but he went on to say that the thing that makes the difference in the players was the attitude. The attitude. The attitude. And I believe it is important for Christians too to have the right attitude. The right attitude toward one another. The right attitude toward the church. The right attitude toward Jesus Christ our Savior. The right attitude toward uh, your elders. The right attitude toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. The right attitude in worship of God. The right attitude when you're playing an instrument up here on the platform. Uh, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? We need the right attitude uh, to be involved in this. And I want to say that as I think about this being proactive or active instead of reactive, what is the first thing that I would want others to do for me. Now think about that for a minute or two. What is the very first thing? Well, I would say I could start by making the statement, the most important thing. And what is the most important thing? I say it's giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, folks. One split second after we die or after the Lord comes, the thing that's going to matter is where one is going to spend eternity. And so I just want to put that up front. What would I want somebody to do for me first of all? Well, that is give me the gospel of Jesus Christ. I realize that most of the lost men don't understand that need. But that's still what they really need. The gospel of Jesus Christ. I do want to bring in another side to this, if I may, please. Uh, while as this is basically in the positive sense and the good sense and the make you feel good sense, so don't ever go out here and say the preacher never makes us feel good. I just made you feel good. What? No amens? Oh well. I'll just go ahead and think I made you feel good then anyway. But I do, I want to remind you of the other side of the coin, if I may. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We need to remember that. Now, everybody needs to remember that in relationship to their dealings with their fellow man as well. Uh, you're going to read. Now, praise God for His grace. Oh, boy. Hey, bear me witness. Doth not our God deal more in grace and mercy with us than He does in justice? Now, the only way that can be is why? Because Jesus shed His blood at Calvary for our sin. 
But praise the Lord, he deals with us in mercy and in grace. And yet, on the other hand, we better have a healthy fear of God and his word. And it does say, be not deceived whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We need to remember that as per Psalms, chapter number 18, verses 20 through 27, to which I again invite your attention, we have an interesting paragraph that would kind of bring this into perspective. In other words, there are usually two sides to the fence. Here the psalmist David had to say, beginning in verse number 20, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Now I have to admit, every time I read that, I, I thank God for his mercy and grace. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta admit, every time I read that, I think to myself, boy, I'm glad I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm glad that God has dealt with me because of the imputed righteousness of our Lord and Savior. And yet, don't forget, this is in the book, isn't it? You see, a lot of people forget that God is a God of justice. And while God is patient and while God is merciful, there comes a day when God has to bring out the willow switch. Now let me read a little bit further here in Psalm chapter number 18, please, if you would with me. I'll begin back in verse number 20 again. The, the psalmist David said, The Lord, Jehovah, all caps, rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. In other words, I didn't pick and choose what I liked and skirt the rest of it. I had all of his judgments before me. I kept the whole counsel of God before me. Let me go back to my reading now. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Now, I... Listen, folks, I know it's of grace. I praise God for it because we at our best are a bunch of bunglers, are we not? That's a nice way of putting it. That ought to have made you feel good that I put it that way instead of, say, instead of saying it the way that it really is. At our best, we're a bunch of sinners. That's what it boils down to. And yet I want to say this, brothers and sisters, listen, we too often forget that we do have a responsibility before our God. Amen. We are to do all things to the glory of God. We are to maintain or try to maintain a testimony that bespeaks of God's wonder and his awesome love for us and his glorious substitutionary death at Calvary for us. Do I not speak the truth? Am I not telling what the Bible teaches us? Yes, we're saved by grace. That's the only way we can be saved. There's not a law given that can save our souls. But God still wants us to live right before him. Just because we're saved by grace does not give us license to act any way we want to act. We're supposed to act like children of the Heavenly Father. Let me read a little bit further here, in case that doesn't put it into plain enough language for you. Maybe the next uh, part of it uh, will. Here he goes on to say, uh, Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. Now look at verse 25. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the forward thou wilt show thyself 
forward. Now again, I want to repeat, I'm thankful for the grace of God. But I'll tell you one thing we need in this day that we live in, and that's for Christianity to realize what this is talking about as well. Because I am afraid that there are too many Christians out there that don't really have a very healthy fear of God at all. And by fear, I don't mean cowing down to God or whatever. I mean a good, healthy love and reverence for God as well as the fear of God. Now listen, I had a dad who loved me. He called me Chip off of the old block. And my brothers and sisters, I don't agree with them, but uh, be that as it may, they all said I was spoiled by my dad because I was the son of his old age. And that wasn't true, brothers and sisters. That's why I don't want you talking to my brothers and sisters too much when they come to visit me. They don't always see things as they ought to see them. But I mean, hey, come on. My dad loved me, and I got, I got to, to tell you, I might as well admit it. Marcia's sitting down here, and she'll tell you if I don't. Uh, uh, I, I think my dad um, had a tendency to spoil me. And I know my sisters did. If you're, if you're a brother and you've got sisters, thank God for them. <laughs> it's all I've got to say. Man, Tyler, you got it made. We're, I don't even see Tyler right there. Tyler down here. You got it made, brother. You, uh, the, uh, but uh, I know my sisters spoil and And my wife, Marshall, will tell you the same thing. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, uh, but I, I want to tell you this, it would only go so far. I remember the time when my dad put away his spoiling and brought out the other side of the coin. And my sisters, as much as I loved them, They didn't give me a free ticket. Well, now, whatever you want, little brother. <laughs> You're so sweet. You're so... Whatever you want. You think my sisters were like that? Are you sisters like that? That only goes for, so far. You love your sisters, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason, yeah, yeah, they'll fight for him and all that. Uh, uh, but they'll fight with him too. <laughs> <laughs> now my sisters and I never fighted <laughs> fighted we never fought we had a few wars <laughs> but we, we never fought what I'm trying to get at is this brothers and sisters listen we'd better remember God is holy and just and good. And the Bible does say, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And it's high time God's people caught a hold of this business with regards to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are two sides to the coin, brothers and sisters. The one of them is all oh, thank God for His grace. Oh, thank God. That's the only way we can be saved. But in this life, do I not speak the truth? God calls on His people to be just that, His people. And we need to, by our lifestyle, reveal our peculiarities in Jesus Christ our Lord, if I may so put it that way. Well, listen, I'm sorry. I wanted to get into the good part and make you feel good so you could leave here feeling real happy and all pleasant and joyful tonight. And uh, that's the verse that says rejoice evermore. Uh, and uh, let me just say this. Our time is up, so I, I won't do it. But... Uh, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Now where'd that come from?
Where did I get that? What? Philippians what? Uh, did I hear 4-4? Four, four? Philippians 4-4? Four, four? That comes from Philippians 4-4. Four, four. That's the verse you need to remember. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. That's what Paul had to say there. And next Wednesday night I want to get into that business about the joy of the Lord and the, some of the peculiarities of it that I think would be especially uh, characteristic of the Christian and be good for us even in the time of trouble. We can have joy in the Lord. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us so. Now listen, if you're a conqueror, that means there was something to conquer. And you can rejoice in this, that he will stand beside us. So let the battle rage. But you hang in there for Jesus Christ and rejoice that you're not alone. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God right there with you. You can be a conqueror in Jesus' name. With that, we'll close our study for this evening. Do you have prayer requests that you would like to make known?